Last time on Vintage Geek, we officially debuted the Panasonic JR200, and I was thoroughly impressed with what I've seen so far. But we have an extensive collection of games and software for this machine, so I thought it justified doing a second video. So today, we're going to play more with the Panasonic JR200 on Vintage Geek. Last time on Vintage Geek, we debuted the JR200 system by Panasonic. We went through the demonstration program that comes with the system, which was very cool, showed off some neat graphics capabilities. And we also played a really fun game called Crazy Maisie, which I will admit I played some after the taping of the video. And I got a little bit better at it, but it's still a very challenging game, and uh, I love the speed and, and the different enemies that come through on that one. But I was so impressed with the system, and because we have such an extensive library here at Vintage Geek, this is one of the few collections that we actually believe that we have every software title that was made for the Panasonic JR200. There was only a few publishers that made titles for it, so it was a little bit easier to collect, and over time we've managed to get copies of all of these. So we wanted to highlight a few more of these today and kind of see what they're like, especially the Disney titles, and we've got some fun stories coming up on that later. I thought next we would try a different brand's game for the Panasonic JR200. One of those publishers was a company called TMQ Software, and this game is called Joe Junkman. Play dirty. Better scoop up the crosstown clutter before it cleans you off the planet. You're Joe Junkman, the city's finest garbage collector. Someone else's can is your pot of gold. Sounds like a nine to five job, huh? Look both ways, buddy. Firebomb the buses, fling garbage cans at the cars, but still score high to make it at the dump site. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to playing this one. That is a sweet garbage truck right there. For 1983 graphics, looks great. There's any key to start game. Start slow. Oh wow, look at this. Where am I? Is this kind of like Frogger? Oh god. Oh. Oh no. <laughs> so if I understand this correctly, I'm supposed to be picking up certain items. Oh, so you can block people and blow them up. Nice. I guess the cars are not affected by whatever the bombs are that you leave. It's only the only the buses. Yeah, let's just go straight to fast. So you're dropping junk piles to defend yourself. Steer, use the joystick. Pick up as many garbage cans and junk piles as possible. Cans are worth 10 points each. Piles are worth 30 points each. When you drop a pile, a maximum of three times allowed per screen, you lose 30 points every time. I don't see an exit in this level, though. Unless I'm just missing it. Oh. <laughs> I guess you just have to continue on. I got it. Ah. <laughs> game over. It's clever. Maneuvering around. It's kind of another maze game, but definitely a little bit more graphically. I feel like this particular game is not as responsive with the controls. The first game, the Crazy Maze game, was actually pretty much right on it as far as moving the joystick. It felt very natural. This one's a little bit delayed. I assume it's because it has more graphics going on, but I'm not really sure. In any case, this is Joe Junkman, and... Uh, it's a, it's a pretty fun game. I like the little buildings and all of the different info on the display. It's a little bit hard to see on the monitor I'm looking at. It's actually better in the capture. Ultimately, it's a fun little game. So while we're looking at TMQ games, I have another game that uh, actually has been on my list for a while. I saw this on a list of JR200 titles that's online, and this is when we were trying to collect all of them. And I was always curious about this one. It's called Mischievous Mansion. Don't throw away the key. Creep downstairs to the dungeon. It's dark, damp, and deadly. With all your might, push open the heavy iron door. It squeaks, then slams shuts behind you. And moments later, the dungeon devils descend to destroy you. Fang flyers swoop down to bite you, knives stab at you. Fire back, escape, but don't just stand there. If you do, the dungeon walls will trap you with deadly accuracy. Discover the dungeon. It's a fun place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> the descriptions on these games are great. So we're going to see what this game is all about for the Panasonic JR200. All right, Panasonic presents Mischievous Mansion by Todd Squires. Press any key. Level one, mold rollers. Oh no, the mold got me. Oh, so you have to get out as well as kill all these things? You should have led with that. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, yes. Ooh, level two, Fang Flyers. No. <laughs> Live knives. <laughs> Ooh, helps to not walk into the knife, I suppose. Attack bats. This is a definitely a mischievous mansion. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> oh no, all right, 2340, that's not bad for a first time. Apparently the attack bats are, uh, it's not my thing. Yes, made it to level five. Evil eyes. Those do look like evil eyes. One last chance at the evil eyes, let's see if I can do it. No! <laughs> well, I still take that as a win. Got past five levels and uh, very fun. It's a simple concept, but I like what they've done there. Yeah, another good game from TMQ for the GR200. Taking a look at another TMQ piece of software, I thought I'd break out a game called Trap It. Wall-to-wall -wall suspense. The sky is full of space ghosts. With deadly diligence, they guard the galaxy against extraterrestrial trespassers like yourself, and they fight to kill. The only way to leave alive is surround the space ghosts with a ghoulish glow. Swallow some energy packets and your glow will grow, but beware these ghosts gobble up your glow till they get to you. Death is at your door until you trap it. I like that this one actually has the Panasonic Presents at the top. I don't think they've all had that. Well, I like their music choice. Apparently you have to grab the uh, things at the top that are glowing and then you can actually create this kind of trap box and trap the enemies in it, I guess. Hey, I finally trapped somebody. So basically it looks like this particular game, the objective is to make these trap boxes around each one of the enemy opponents. But in order to do that, you've got to hit them first with some kind of a missile or bullet or whatever it is that you're shooting. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna admit it makes it a pretty challenging a bit of gameplay, at least for me, I, I'm sure a lot of people would get this right away, but it is uh, pretty challenging. And you've got this kind of laser beam thing at the top that also can kill you. And as you go, if you, if you do more things, it takes away your tail, so then you can't make a box. Or if they run into your tail, that also seems to do that. And then you have to go get more of these energy crystals, I guess. <laughs> of course, if you collide with them, then you instantly die. Let's see if I can trap this one. Ah, see, I made a box around him. I got him. All right. Now I just have to repeat the process with all the other characters. <laughs> this is only level zero, so uh, we could be in for a long one on this. This game is uh, not for me, apparently. <laughs> it is uh, complicated. It seems like uh, you could really get good at it, I suppose, if you spend enough time, but building those traps and everything, uh, that part of it I get, but being able to actually shoot them and then put the trap around them, that makes it definitely difficult. But uh, still, it's creative and I like what they've done with it, so decent game from uh, TMQ there for the JR200. I want to talk a little bit today about the Disney software for the Panasonic JR200U. We're going to be covering Winnie the Pooh's Lucky Letter Game, a delightful computer learning adventure that develops beginning reading readiness skills for ages 3 to 7. The software company that was working on this apparently noticed early on that with a game that uses letter combinations to make words, especially in the four-letter variety, a number of colorful world words could be included that Disney definitely didn't want included in the game. So what they did is they actually excluded certain patterns in the code to make sure that those combinations would never show up. But in order to do so, they actually required a list from Disney of the four-letter words that they needed to exclude. And apparently uh, Disney would not put this on letterhead. They actually had someone in the office write them down on a piece of paper and send them over to the software developer because they didn't want that in print anywhere. I thought that was a really funny story. I don't know if it's true or not. It was in one of the online forums, but uh, it sounds plausible for the time. We're gonna try to play Winnie the Pooh's Lucky Letter Game and see what this game is all about on our Panasonic JR200. Winnie the Pooh. You can do three letter words, four letter words, or five letter words. Well, let's do four letter words so we know what we're doing here. 
So type one or two. Oh, I guess we can do upper and lower case. It's cool that they give you that option. A very hungry Winnie the Pooh is standing below a full pot of honey, which is suspended from a high tree branch. There are four balloons circling in and out of Pooh's honey pot. Each balloon contains a letter. The object of the game is for you to help Pooh gather enough letter balloons to form words so that he can float like a cloud up to the honey pot and eat. To do this, you must match the letter flashing in the cloud at the top of the screen with the correct letter in one of the four balloons. Oh, so it's definitely as easy as I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, so this is a really simplified game for young players. Essentially, it's just kind of learning where the letters are on the keyboard and all of that. So they're giving you the, the letter in the top left, and then you have to pick when it hits into the honey pot, and you hit space bar. And then you do this for the rest of the letters. And then you're supposed to type it, which would help you find the letters on the keyboard if you're getting used to computers. Yay! Who got to the honey pot? Any difference with five letter words? Definitely got a nice little reward for the kid for getting the letters right and typing it out at the end. So, well done on that. Definitely could see where they'd be concerned about the four letter word uh, in the randomization of the software. So, I'm glad that uh, they were able to exclude those from the final game. Now, we've talked so far about TMQ, we've talked about Datamost and Disney, but the one company that made software titles for the JR200 that we haven't talked about is Instant Software. Now, this was a company out of New Hampshire, and from the comments that I read online and some of the feedback, some people were kind of critical of Instant Software, that these were just kind of churned out pieces of software that came from other systems and there wasn't too much inventive about them. However, when I read the title and info for this particular game, Santa Peravia and Fumaccio, it sounded kind of interesting. The year is 1400 AD and you're the ruler of a tiny Italian city-state. You're ambitious by nature and intend to build your little city-state into a powerful kingdom. So begins Santa Peravia and Fumaccio, where you and your fellow players compete as rulers of neighboring cities. You control the grain harvest, feed your people, set tax rates, exercise justice, and invest in public works. I'm gonna say right now that this game may be more involved than we have time for on this video today, but uh, I'm gonna see what the gameplay is like and uh, get a general sense for it on our JR200. After a long load time, this one took about a full seven minutes, it's asking if we need instructions. So I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. Okay, the computer will draw a map of your state. The area within the wall grows as you buy more land. The size of your guard tower in the upper left corner indicates the adequacy of your defenses. If it shrinks, equip more serfs as soldiers. If the horse and plowman is touching the north wall, all of your land is being cultivated. If not, you should attract more serfs by releasing more grain than the demand. If you release less than the demand, some of your people will starve. High taxes raise money, but slow down economic growth. Well, I'm just gonna play one player, I guess. Who rules Santa Paravia? Um, I don't know, vintage geek. Man, all right. I'm gonna go with Apprentice, gotta start somewhere. Oh no, rats ate 4% of the reserves. Excellent weather means great harvest, grain reserve, grain demand, grain price, land price. So it looks like we can either buy grain, sell grain, buy land, or sell land. Well, I guess if we had a great harvest, we might as well sell some grain, right? And then maybe buy land after we sell our grain. How much grain to sell? Well, the demand is 11,000. So if we put out 11,400. All right, now we've uh, met the demand, technically. We have 1,364.8 florins, whatever that currency means. How much land can we buy with that? I assume this is in hectares, so I'm gonna just say 100. Guess that's all we need to do right at the moment. Release how much grain? Minimum 6,300, maximum is 25, 202. Now well, let's do the maximum. Get a lot of grain out there. All right, so 140 serfs were born this year, 42 died, four serfs moved into the city, and you paid soldiers 75 florins. I mean, this seems appropriate. I don't know what these numbers should be, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say continue. Okay, well I see the little plowman is all the way up to the fence, so that means that we've used up all the land for farming, I guess. So right now we have 2,156 florins. Well, let's get a marketplace. Let's sell some grain, get some money, I guess. Let's release the demand amount of grain. Let's see what that map looks like now. Harvested all the grain again, it looks like. It's an interesting concept for sure. Kind of a, an early simulator, if you will, where you're basically 
controlling all the variables in this particular medieval state. I guess the goal is to uh, come out on top and be the king or queen at the end. So, well, now I have a much more complete view of the types of software that were available for the Panasonic JR200. I'm glad I was able to spend the time and go through some of these software titles, especially ones from the different companies. I was disappointed that some of them would not load. There's quite a few issues with loading these old cassettes, and one of the things that I'm going to work toward here at Vintage Geek is having a more archival system for being able to take these cassettes, put them in digital form, and then play them back using a little bit more modern piece of equipment because these are not holding up well over time. Some of the cassettes just won't load at all, and uh, some of them I'm hoping we might be able to fix up by putting them in an audio editing program and taking a look and seeing if we can clean them up a little bit. But overall, pretty impressed with the system. I do like the JR200 as a computer and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool little machine. So I really want to thank you for taking the time to join us here on Vintage Geek. If you like what you were doing and you want to support the channel, please like and subscribe. It's going to help us a lot going forward. Also, we have merch available. There's a link in the description. If you'd like to get a cool shirt like the one I'm wearing today, we have lots of different choices as well. Be sure to check that out. Thanks for watching the video today. I'm Aaron, and that's Vintage Geek.